I've heard from a lot of families who talk about that spirit that comes to them in dreams to kind of tell them either what to do or to, hey, continue fighting. Has he come to you in dreams or anywhere to kind of say, this is what you need to do next? All the time. Yes, all the time. It's kind of strange talking about it because a lot of people don't believe in spirits. A lot of people don't believe in that. Yeah, it's true because John helps me so much. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you how I found out John got beat. The next day after John died, I, I, my head was hurting so bad, I laid on the couch. And when I fell asleep, the deputies was beating me in my, in my dream. It was started with one. It was so many was on top of me, I couldn't even move. And another time, this was just like a couple of days later, I had a dream John was laying in the bed. He had his head facing the wall. And he was in a fetal position, curled up. And I was like, why is he facing the wall in my dream? I knew him facing that wall wasn't right. One of the deputies said the same thing. The inmates don't do that. And John always told me that. He said, mama, when I'm laying in them beds, I never keep, I, my back is to the wall and I'm watching the dope. When I seen him in my dream doing that, and not only have he came to me, he came to my daughter, came to his father. I mean, for you to say that, that other mothers said that, it's the truth. Our kids do be with us in spirit. And it ain't because we want them to. It's just that's what it is. And it's hard to tell somebody that if they have an experience. And I understand that because a lot of people be like, oh, they losing their mind or they doing this, they doing that. But we know what's going on with us. Man, he was funny, you know, goofy. Always made a nigga laugh. Good person to be around, no good vibe, good energy. He was a natural artist and music. It was just like second nature to him. So what happened was, they took this guy to jail and took John to jail too. Every time I went and put a visiting pass in, they denied it and told me that he was in protective custody. But then I found out the truth, he was in lockup. And then that's when I asked the watch command. I haven't seen my son almost 30 days. This was Sunday. He said, call me Wednesday and I'll let you know what day you can see your son. And they came out the next day and told me John was dead. The voice came to me and said, get up. You let evidence get away. And I hopped right up to my feet. Hi, I'm Adele Coleman. Thank you for tuning in to Say Their Name, brought to you by DCP Entertainment. This series takes a deeper look into the impact of the assault and killing of Black people by the police and in Stand Your Ground states. We share the stories from families who have been negatively impacted by the police. We did not talk to officers or to governing bodies, just the families and their support systems. We are not the court of law, nor do we try to be for legal purposes. We are not here to presume guilt or innocence for anyone because, quite frankly, we do not want to be sued. We simply want to give the families a voice while examining what happens when the hashtags stop and the news cycle unfortunately moves on to the next big story. All we want to do is give the families the opportunity to control their narrative and share ways that we can all help. Warning, some of the discussions may be particularly disturbing and even emotionally overwhelming at times. When one of those moments occur that may be particularly triggering, you will hear this chime. For more specific details on the timing of these moments, please visit our show notes. On this episode of Say Their Name, we focus on John Horton. On March 30th, 2009, John Horton, a young, budding music producer who was excited about the next stage of his life, was found dead in a solitary confinement cell at Los Angeles County Men's Central Jail. John was only 22 years old. Having recently experienced that birthday in that same isolated cell, 
He had only served about 30 days of his three-year sentence after not reporting to a court-ordered rehab, which stemmed from him taking a plea deal to try and avoid that very sentence. The reports coming from the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, which operates the jail, was that John has taken his own life. But at this point, his mother Helen Jones and the rest of the family had just started to learn of the news from two homicide detectives. My husband came to the door. He said the homicide detective gave me this card and told him just call to the corner and they got his body. I didn't even know how John even died at that time. So I asked my husband, I said, how did they say he died? And he said, they say he hung himself. I thought they was going to say he got stabbed, anything but to say he killed himself. I knew that was a lie right off the top. Like three months before he got killed, we was talking about it. I said, John, is you, are you scared to go to jail? He said, no, nah, mom, I'm not. He said, no. He said, matter of fact, I can't wait to get it over with. I'm just not going to go turn myself in. He said, but honestly, I really want to get this behind me so I can come back out and put my life together. He said, that's what I really want to do. So I knew, I knew they killed him. I knew that. So I said, what did they say? They said he had a fight with an inmate and they put him in a hole. The clothes, the stuff they gave him with the go in the hole, the clothes, he, he ripped that up and hung himself with it, with some t-shirts. I said, okay. By me watching Forensic Files and ID trying, I used to love all that, you know, that mystery, figuring stuff out. I knew what to do because I seen all the stuff I had to read between eight lines, like, okay, he had a fight with an inmate, he put him in a hole, and he hung himself. Why would they say he had a fight with an inmate when he in a hole? You already got him in lockup. So how is he fighting an inmate? When y'all get him out of cell, he already got ankle stuff and hand chains. So I said, okay, you know that's a lie. I said, so why would they lie that? He got to have scars for them to say he had a fight. That's why they saying he had the fight. So when you see the scars on him, when he come to the mortuary, you're going to think he got those in the fight. But I knew it was a lie. So I got my story read between the lines. So I said, OK, I know what happened to my baby. He was beaten solitary confinement because that's where I had him at. I had to get my bluff together. So I called him and I said, you have my son, John Horton. And they said, what's his number? I gave him the number on the card. And they said, yeah, ma'am, we have him. And I said, well, what y'all trying to say he died of? And they said, well, ma'am, right now, and they got him at suicide. And I said, I know y'all killed my son. I know y'all beat my son to death. And I know y'all finna try to cover it up and help the sheriff get away with beating my son to death. And the man was like, ma'am, you shouldn't be saying that, accusing us of that. That's not right. And I said, I know that's what happened. I told him, don't touch none of those scars. I said, because I'm getting my autopsy done right after you get do, do yours. So he was like, oh, you have your own pathologist? I said, yeah, I got my own family pathologist. That's why they put the injuries down in the autopsy, because they didn't know what I knew, and they didn't know what I was going to do. So. My bluff did work on him, and I'm glad of that. According to court order documents, the coroner's autopsy found that John Horton had a ligature mark around his neck and hematoma in his liver and kidney area with signs of blunt force trauma. They ruled that his death was caused by asphyxia due to a self-inflicted hanging. They did they autopsy somewhere up in there, like April the 1st. I got the second autopsy within like maybe like three, four days. But I got a second autopsy just being desperate to prove that he didn't kill himself. And the second autopsy that I got came from 1-800-OPTOPSY. And they, they doctor that did the autopsy was working with the sheriff department and the county coroner too. He didn't even agree with them. He said John don't have no scars, ain't nothing wrong with him, ain't no bruises, no lacerations, no nothing. It made them look bad and made him look bad, too. So he didn't put nothing that they stuff down. Only thing he tried to put down that they put down is that uh, you can die standing up on your feet. They trying to say John died sitting on the bed with his feet touching the floor and his buttocks touching the bed. When they said that, 
I was kind of confused, like, okay, was he was was he standing up? What is y'all trying to say? But all the time, John never was hung. He never hung himself. You beat him to death. You made a noose out the, you know, one of those old granny blankets that you can't rip, that the woven, yeah, that you can't rip that. In no way, I'm talking about me and you and 10 people couldn't rip it. They didn't rip it, they cut it. They cut it, cause it was, it was straight. But everything at the county corner, whatever they say between the homicide detective, they talked, cause I got paperwork looking at them talking. I even have the conversation between my doctor that I hired and the pathologist at the county corner. They wanted to know about facial bruising. This one doctor telling the other one. I got it in black and white. Helen was able to obtain the reports and images from the two conflicting autopsies. She felt like she now had the evidence she needed to get justice for her son, John. But she still needed a legal team to help her pursue the case. A couple of people knew I was looking for an attorney. I was calling around trying to find attorneys and they was telling me that ain't nobody killed my son. Oh, I went through hell trying to find an attorney because didn't nobody believe me that the police beat my son to death. I said, I got pictures. Oh, ma'am, don't worry. Nobody want to see no pictures. Ain't nobody killed your son. And this ain't nobody do no police beat nobody's death. What is you talking about? I went through all that for about almost a month. And that's calling lawyers every day, every day. A friend of mine, he found the lawyer for me. And he was like, you know what? I think you would like these two attorneys. And then I met him and then hired him that day. One name is Dennis Wilson and one name is Anthony Ludy. The first day they came here and visited me, they said it too. They say they beat him to death. You got the picture because we took pictures at the mortuary. And John was also handcuffed by one arm when they was beating him. The handcuff was on his wrist so tight that it left a flesh ring. He must was trying to get out of it. It cut all an even circle in flesh around his wrist. It was that deep. Probably while they was beating him, he trying to get out of it, whatever they had him handcuffed to. A lot of my family members been through that county jail. They know, they know what's there. They was like, John wouldn't kill himself. My nephew, he said, auntie, that's flashlight therapy on John's forehead. And I said, what is flashlight therapy? He said, that's when they hit you in your head with a flashlight. He said, I don't see many people get beat with that flashlight. Many. The sheriff department, that's one of their signature abuses is flashlight therapy. They have names for what they do to people. I remember my nephew told me it was a picture of John Wayne inside one of the halls, and they couldn't even look at John Wayne. You better not look at John Wayne. And they'd tell him, don't look at John Wayne. Keep your head forward, you look at him. They said they used to be walking like this, trying their best, you know, not to peek. But you get bust upside the head, you look at John Wayne. New guys will come in, they don't know to tuck their shirts. You get killed for not tucking your shirt. I done heard so many war stories on how guys didn't know. Cause it's your first time. They trying to say people, hey, tuck your shirt. They get bust upside the head trying to tell them. All their abuses that they give to Folks, they have a name for them. It's a signature abuse that they doing. My first time seeing John body, I had to be drug in there. I couldn't go in there, mom. I had to tell my family, pick me up and take me in there. Cause I'm, I can't go on my own. My feet was going the other direction. I, I don't even know if anybody ever experienced that, but my feet was trying to go the other way. I, I was too scared to go seeing cause I didn't know if I was, my brain was gonna snap or, I just didn't know what would happen if I see my child laying here dead on a slab. I just didn't know what it would do to me. I was so scared to go in there. So I told my cousin and my best friend, I said, drag me in there, drag me in there. And they was like, you, you, you shouldn't go. I say, how I'm not gonna see his body. That ain't making no sense. Drag me in there, I can't go. So they dragged me in there kicking and screaming, but once I got in there, my mother-in-law, she buried six of her kids. And at that time, she had buried like four of her kids. And she was just telling me, she said, Helen, 
You're going to be all right once you see him. You're going to go through that, but you're going to be at peace with him once you, and that's exactly what happened. She knew because she lost, you know, so many kids. So once I seen him, once I went through my little motion, and then once I did that, I had to go to work, start looking at his body and seeing what was going on. Helen Jones now had a legal team that was ready to fight with her to get justice for her son, John Horton. But Helen also had to continue to push back against reports from the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department that her son was a danger to himself. Oh, yeah. That was the first thing they said, that he beat himself because they were saying he was mentally ill. So that's where the mentally ill stuff worked in. Try They try to fit that in. Oh, he mentally ill, so he hung himself. But he mentally ill and he over here in Men's Central Jail? In, in the hole? But he mentally ill? That's what I'm saying. Just, they can't even keep their lies straight because they tell so many. He mentally ill, but he over across the street in Men's Central Jail in the dungeon. The mentally ill folks that's sick is right across the street. Because that's what the hospital had at Twin Towers, the medical unit. So what is he doing over here if he had a problem? I'm going to give you something that the media says. They say that he had an overdose, and that's why he ended up in the hospital. And once he got better, then they took him to jail. And that is a lie. He didn't have no overdose. If he done had an overdose and did all this, what is he doing over here in Men's Central Jail? It don't even make no sense. When he was in court, maybe his last day in court, the judge say, I'm going to recommend him to go to fire camp because he looking at John Cage. This boy don't got no business going to no prison. I know he probably looking at his record like, this man ain't never did no violent crime. This ain't even his case. You put him on t- What is y'all doing? And he told me, I'm going to get him fire camp. I told the judge, thank you. I really appreciate that because the judge was a black judge, and I think he's seeing, like, I'm not sending this boy to no prison. And this what he in here for, getting three years? He said, no, I'm going to recommend fire camp for him. Fire camp is just, you know, closed camp. They send you out on fire. They let you know those guys that turn into firemen, you know, for the county. And they may be working for like a dollar some a day or two dollars some a day or something like that. But that's what fire camp is. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something what happened. I came to tr- court three days in a row and John was a no show. And I'm like, what? So the sheriff say, he wouldn't come out of his cell. But let me tell you what the bailiff said to me. The bailiff said, your son had an altercation with the sheriff department. That's why he's not in court, because they beat him that day. How the bailiff in the court knew it, I don't know how he knew it, but that's what he told me. And I said, what? He said, no, 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 no. He tried to take it back. I said, no, I heard what you said. So that's how I found out Something had happened to John, but I just didn't know how it took place and when it took place. But the bailiff told me that. That's the reason why John wasn't in court, because because the sheriff jumped on him. After John's death, and not long after retaining her legal team, the original coroner that had been employed by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department changed their cause of death ruling from suicide to undetermined. Because they knew that they wouldn't be able to keep going with saying that it was suicide with a busted liver, busted kidney, busted pancreas, busted pelvis, spleen, everything. John had at least like seven to eight organs that was busted. I mean, it was like, it was damaged. He was bleeding, internally bleeding from all those wounds. And even after you changed his cause of death, you never came out and made a public statement and say that this is no longer suicide. Now it's undetermined because you don't want to put murder down. So you want to make up an undetermined, here it is, undetermined, but no, he killed you. Over here you say he killed himself, he done hung himself, all this. Now ain't no more suicide. So now you go to undetermined, like, give me a break. And then there was another major development in the case. A letter was discovered written by the person in the cell next to John. The letter mentioned that John appeared to have been dead for a while, that negligence by deputy guards is rampant, and that John appeared to have mental health struggles. The letter also mentioned that it had been carbon copied and mailed to other agencies, including the ACLU, also known as the American Civil Liberties Union. But you know the guy with the letter is a setup too, right? That's not real. 
That's a setup somewhere. I know John. First thing John gonna be crying about my mama, I ain't seeing my mama, they, they stopped me from seeing her. He never mentioned not one time John haven't seen his mama. It's just certain things I know John. Only thing he mentioned is guy in the letter about John, John is a boxer. You could have got that from anywhere. It was a carbon copy. How you getting a carbon copy? You're in solitary confinement. How you getting a carbon copy? Then in the end, where's the inmate? The inmate never been interviewed by nobody. I think the inmate was planted. In that letter, he talks about them pulling the body out and being all this rigor mortis and the medical examiner basically saying like, how long has he been in here? He looks stiff. Was that true? Not the medical examiner, but the fire department, that's who came. That's who asked him, when was the last time y'all seen him? And one of the deputies, and he said, 15 to 30 minutes ago. And he said, nah, you ain't seen him alive no 15, 30 minutes ago, cause he been dead for a few hours. Then that's when Scanner Gate got made up. You ever heard of that, the Scanner Gate scanner? That's John, but they just never mentioned his name. Deputies didn't make Scanner Gate up. The Sheriff Department made Scanner Gate up. Cause Scanner Gate is saying this, I never physically went to John Horton's cell. I cheated on a cheat sheet at my desk. I scanned it on my desk on a fake cheat. They copied the barcodes and he just scanned the cheat sheet instead of going to the cell and scanning the scale. The sheriff department would go far and wide to cover up for their deputies. According to the LA Times, Scannergate was a scandal where the L.A. County Sheriff's deputies at the Men's Central Jail used fake scanner codes to avoid making their required inmates welfare and security checks. Electronic checkpoints with barcodes had been set up around the jail to ensure that regular checks occurred. But after John's death, an internal investigation showed that a deputy went by John's cell after he was already dead. And they also discovered that the deputy scanned several parts of the jail in just 35 seconds which was physically impossible. But all of this new information seems suspicious to Helen because it seemed like the sheriff's department wanted people to view this as negligence as opposed to homicide. If you ever go pull up Scanner Gate Scanner, me and Central Jail, it's a made up scan to cover up John Depp. So that's when I learned that it was 10 deputies. All those deputies got disciplined that night. Two of them got fired. The other one got, what, 30-day extension for killing somebody. They all got little slaps on the wrist, that you ask me. You get fired for killing somebody. Once the lawyers got it and start having depositions, then that's when I start learning the names. Because yeah, depositions, yeah, that's part of the civil case. Exactly. Off top, Christopher Kidder, Cliff Yates, his little stanky butt. He a comedian. Oh, he, he been a comedian for years beating inmates, killing inmates. And then he do comedian acts with his pistols and all that. I can show you him on the internet right now. All right, I'm so glad to be here. I actually, I really am a cop. I'm LA's comedy cop, but I'm not with the LAPD. Some people think I am, but I'm not. I'm with the Sheriff's Department and we're different. We shoot people in the front. Just kidding. Cliff Yates, he's a comedian. And, being a, and he's doing his acts with his guns. William Penhalo, Mark Romero. Mark Romero is the worst out of all of them because he the one beat John on March the 4th through John and K-10, and then they killed him. The 3,000 boys, they ran that floor. They really ran that jail, 2,000 boys well, yeah. But I heard the 3,000 boys more worse than the 2,000 boys. Like, they, nobody got nothing on the on the 3,000 boys. They was the worst out of all the police gangs. They start in the county jail, and then they merge out to the street once they be able to go to patrol. They gain rank once they either beat an inmate or kill an inmate. That's like part of the initiation. I heard they get money, cars, vacations. It's like an enterprise. If you abuse, if you're a good abuser, you get awarded for being a good abuser. And that ink, like them tattoos they got, they have to earn them tattoos. And you see all their tattoos and skulls. 
Every last one of those tattoos got a skull somewhere in there. I think that just represents death for them. There's something to that for all of them to have skulls. Of all the 10 officers potentially involved in John's death, Deputy Mark Romero seemed to be the one most involved in John's injuries and death. They killed him. And Mark Romero, his name would never have came up if one of the other deputies didn't tell on him. Because the night John got killed, those deputies tried to put it on the shift before them. Yeah, they tried to put it on the earlier shift that he died on their shift. And one of the deputies was only like, oh, this what y'all trying to do to us? He let them know John had some type of altercation with another deputy. That was the deputy that beat John and he's on videotape. Mark Romero, that was the deputy that beat John. He was in the chair strapped after they beat him, pepper sprayed him, had him his arm twist behind his back, handcuffed. You could just see he was looked like he was about to die. He was in, you could just tell he was in pain. They was asking him, are you in pain? And he letting them know, yeah, I'm in pain. I'm he was in so much pain he couldn't even open his eyes up because they they pepper sprayed him. They didn't even try to give him no medical attention and they just videotaped him to try to help themselves. Because I heard once they beat somebody and they get caught by certain lieutenants, or they have to videotape them, show them what they done. Even Mark Romero admitted to beating him. After Mark Romero did what he did to him, about seven, eight other deputies finished working on him and beating him. And you already beat him on March the 4th. And you videotaped him from that first beating. Then you didn't take him to the hospital or even across the street. You took him right up and put him right back where you had him at. Then you kill him three weeks later. I look at it like this. That's no manslaughter. That's murder. When you beat somebody twice, you could might get away with saying you it was manslaughter if you beat him once. And I still wouldn't go for that. No manslaughter. But you beat him twice. Then you handcuffed him and hold him to something. Not only that, you could have saved his life if you would have gave him some help. You didn't want to do that. You beat him bad. Not only did y'all beat him bad, some of his injuries y'all covered up when y'all was beating because you know they, they do that. They can put a towel or a blanket around you. And if they hit you there, the injuries won't come on the outside. It'll be inside. It's like the rubber hoses back in the day. Oh, Lord, you heard of that. That's in John's deposition. I didn't hear about it with John, but I just know in, in the history of black people in this country, they would beat us with hoses because we would bruise on the inside. It would hurt our, you know, our insides, but you won't have that bruising on the outside. So it's the way to, to beat people in a way that they can't then go and say, well, look what happened to me. I was trying to understand the pathologist that did the second autopsy. He mentioned that in his deposition. He admitted that he had a cousin that was working in the Chicago police station, and he said the exact words. He said, my cousin admitted to me that they used to rubber hose people. And I never got that explained to me. It's in his deposition. You the first person I ever heard that repeated that same line. Because I was just trying to imagine, what is they doing with the rubber hose? It's the same thing as the towel. Exactly. He say that he learned that in his physics class in the army. Say like if somebody wouldn't clean up or wouldn't do what they supposed to do, they're rapping and then beating. And you would never know what a bruise is at. You would never know what they did to him because of all the injuries in his side. You know what? Mark Romero have never even been interviewed by homicide, nobody. He was left out. In his deposition, the lawyer asked him, what was he doing today? And he said he worked at the Leonwood Station. That was back like in 2015. But he said he was in the process of becoming a homicide detective. He was becoming a detective and he is totally responsible really for John being dead today. I know it. He broke his hand beating John. That's what he said, he broke his hand. And I don't even know if that's true, that he broke his hand. But, but he did admit to beating John. And the reason why I said I don't know if that's true, 
if he broke, he really truly broke his hand because in the deposition they asked him, how long did you keep your cast on? Did you have a cast? He said, yeah. They said, well, how long? He said, I don't know. Like, what? And I'm like, you should know these things. So he could be lying about that too, just to say he wasn't able to do nothing when John got killed. And then they asked him also, was you on duty when John was found? He said, I'm not for sure. He was there. The Pen Hollow, one of the ones that's caught up in the case, they asked Pen Hollow, who worked with you the night you worked? He said, Mark Romero. You caught up no matter how you try to, it's our system won't hold them accountable, making sure y'all get away with killing. The depositions that Helen referred to were part of her civil case against the county and multiple individuals of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. The lawsuit was for negligence, wrong for death. It's just saying that he had a right to life. It was also for that he had a, a right to not be beaten while he was alive. It was a lot of different parts to it. I have never met a mother that wanted that money. I can honestly say that. I even met mothers today, didn't even want to go get the check. Left it there. You know, this y'all garbage money, you making me take this, but, but I'd rather have that justice, but I can't get it. Cause it's, it's no justice for us. But going through those depositions, it was hard. Cause the, they lawyers try to rip you apart. They, in those depositions, they want to know everything. They want to see how good you know your child. What was he doing when he was one years old? How did he act when he was two years old? Did you give him money? Did he do chores around the house? They, they don't have nothing but trick questions through the whole deposition. They want to try to paint us as unfit parents, like we don't care about our kids. But you kill our child, but we the ones on the stove. But that's the way this is set up. People don't know that, but the family goes on trial. It's the most saddest thing because they want you to act up. They want up. They want us to show what we really feel. That's what they want. But it's like we're not doing that. We want to, but we know we can't. You know what I'm saying? But. It's sad. It, it, it is sad the way they got this system set up with the deposition. But I was in deposition with Mark Romero. He realized what he got himself in. I'm sitting right across watching him and really trying to just mess him up. And he was. He was lying. First he started sweating. Then it turned into grease. If he just got sprayed with some oil or something. Yeah, first he was sweating. Coming down, I'm like, ooh. Then, then, then the sweat dried up, and then the grease came. I'm like, Lord have mercy. I wanted him to lie, and he did. He lied. He said, I don't think I was there that night. You was there. You was there. Because your partner said you was there. You was there. How your partner remember, but you don't. You was there. You know, his lawyer would just tell him what, would try to tell him what not the answer. But sometimes they speak fast and say it anyway. So he was doing that a few times. He really got prepared for his deposition. You could tell that. But only thing he would say, I don't remember. I don't recall. I don't know. You lying. He was just lying. But the lawyers do tell them to do that. The lawyers do tell them to do that. Just say you don't remember in case you get caught up later on. Helen and her family did eventually receive a settlement from the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. And though we're not disclosing the settlement amount, it's important to understand the indignity the family faced as they went through this process. Maybe like year that the lawyers got in, they was trying to offer money. About $100,000. That was just the first year. So we went on for seven more years after that. So they was doing that. They was playing games with me. They would put it on the table and take it off. Or they put this on the table, then they'll take it back. Then they'll put it on again, put some more on it and take it back. So they did that for almost eight years. I don't see them do worse than that. Sometimes they used to start off with like $7,000. The arm worth seven, because they go by body parts. People don't know that. Okay, his arm got messed up. Well, how much is that? 400 or 7,000 for the arm, such and such for the leg. Oh, for the kidney. 
how much for a kidney? They play in those games in those rooms with, with family members. That's what they do in mediation. I didn't even stay in mediation. I didn't want to settle. That's not something I wanted to do because I felt we could have won in court. I want my baby to have his day in court and trial so I could prove with these men because I knew we could have proved it, but you know how that goes. The lawyers, they didn't want to take it to trial. I just didn't like it when it came to the settlement part. That's the only time we had a disagreement is when it came to settlement because I felt like we could have won. And I didn't like it. They know I didn't like it. it um, I boo-hooed and cried. <laughs> they looking at me like, lady, take this money. And I'm looking like them, like, this is no money. You're just not your child. So you, you know, you don't, you don't know what I feel. This, this is my son, this is my baby. And even if we didn't win in court, everybody would have seen the truth. I know we would have won. I truly felt we would have won. And I truly think they know that today too. But at the time, they were just saying, Helen, it ain't that many cases like this. I'm not saying John was the only one that happened to. But at that time, he was the only case that made it to the open. And they were just saying, ain't enough case happened like that yet. But it did after. Like now, you're seeing it. John got killed. Like y'all y'all couldn't stop killing. Like y'all, y'all never stopped. I mean, wish they was doing it all alone, getting behind closed doors, and you know, we just didn't hear about killing that they did. But once John got killed, it seemed like, like y'all just got killing fever, like y'all just couldn't stop killing. Like, and y'all still haven't stopped today. Helen may have been successful in getting a settlement amount, but her primary goal was, and still continues to be, getting justice for her son's death while helping families who have suffered a similar loss. Part of that drive came from the lack of organizational support she received early in her fight for justice. And the little support that she did receive, sometimes it felt a little misguided, even from well-intentioned organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union, also known as the ACLU. Yeah, I had communication with them, but they was going off of what the Sheriff Department told them, that it was suicide. And to me, they just reported the news that what they was told and didn't know what really took place at that time. I know they was trying to help. I know that. And I am grateful that they did come into the case. I just wish that they didn't run off of what the sheriff department said because the sheriff department told a straight ball face lie. Then you pushed it out there for everybody else. Support was hard to find because really wasn't no orgs was out at that time. Black Lives Matter didn't exist. Uh, Dignity and Power Now didn't exist. So it was hard. It was, it was just me and my family and, and the people that you see here. It was, I didn't get support until Black Lives Matter and DPN. That was years later. You know what? Let me take that back. Earl Hutchison, that's who helped John Case get in the news. Earl Hutchison. He helped organize the first protest we gave. Even within like 30 days, that's when I met him. He got it in the news from there. I didn't meet Black Lives Matter and DPN until 2017, going on five years ago. That's when I met Black Lives Matter and been working with them ever since. Going out speaking, you know, like if other mothers that need information, want to know what's the next steps what's coming next. Just being there for support for them and going out speaking and bringing awareness and going on different panels and speak with them, stuff like that. By me already was doing it. I, I learned, you know, I had to learn just off top, being a mother crying, you know, trying to speak out. I learned that way, having to do it. And then, of course, by being with Black Lives Matter and Dignity and Power Now, going out there with them and learning from them, you know, watching them. And, but still to this day, I have never got comfortable with getting out talking. It just has to be done. So I don't have no choice. That's how I look at it. I don't have no choice. I have a duty here, not only to John, but I have a duty to the rest of our children out here and the rest of our folks, because these are our families, whether we like it or not. These, are, these kids belong to us, you know, and that's just how I look at it. I'm a community organizer with Dignity and Power Now. We also just launched a program that's called Project Stop the Line. This is for youth that's in impacted communities. And the concept of 
Project Stop the Line is to stop every line for our youth in between the ages of 13 and 25 because that's who the system is really trying to take a hold on is that age. And, and it's easy for them to get caught up in this trap out here that our system got for them. That's what we created this program to try to stop this system. Get your hand off our kids. Because if we can get them to get their hands off that group, then that prison line will be cut short because they don't belong there. It's hard. I've been through it. I've been through it as a youth myself. I know the experience. Once they get their hands on you, it's like they don't want to let you go. Reason why? Because that's how they make their money is incarcerating you and then being paid because the probation officer get paid for probation you. The CEO get paid for watching you. They get paid, you know, so everybody making money off of our youth. Look who they got their hand on, black and brown. That's who you got your hand on. I done seen them take people to jail. What you doing? Man, I got a job. Well, not today, you don't. They knowing if they take you to jail for something. I know a few people got done like that around here. Once they tell them they got a job, man, I'm, I don't game bang. I don't do this. I don't do that, man. I got a job. Not today. You won't have a job tomorrow because they're going to find something to take you for just to destroy your life. And I also knew somebody that used to be in the share department years ago, but they fell out with the share department. He said that in the 80s, they was trying to make sure that they gave out as many felonies as they could. So we couldn't get these jobs. They didn't want us in that workforce at all. They wanted to make sure they killed that off. On that topic, we'll talk for weeks and years. We can talk for a lifetime about them because for a lifetime, they've been doing this. For my whole lifetime, I always heard stories about this and this and that until it really hit your family, like until it really hit your homie, like, oh, hold on. These motherfuckers can't be that cruel. Yeah, these niggas is cruel. We just regular people trying to make an honest living. That's all we trying to do. That's John's younger brother. Roderick. We already in the struggle because we black. I already got it hard because I'm black. That's what I've been knew growing up. My mom always told me that. Too. You already got a strike on you because you black, son. Remember that. Folks don't give a fuck about you out there. Them folks will run you over in the dirt. Like, ain't nothing ever happened. And I seen that shit to where, like, I done got poor treatment by plenty of officers. Not all of them, but by plenty of officers. Got hemped up for no reason. Guns drawing out on me. What if you accidentally squeeze that trigger? I'm through. I can't talk back because that's what we taught to, not talk back. Just shut up. When you try to voice your opinion to the police, guess what happened? They're going to voice their opinion. And that battle, we see how that battle got us. Yeah, man, we got to do something about it, but slowly but surely. And I play it smart, especially in this neighborhood. You know, because when you play that good Samaritan role and you try to talk and get in their way, we see it happen all the time in the streets. When we try to talk back, man, you, you niggas is racist. Why, why y'all doing this? Y'all niggas is blah, 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 blah. police brutality. Hey, man, shut the fuck up. They talk bad to us. We can't say nothing. And then, who we gonna report it to? I was brought up to believe that I'm already a wanted man. Being a black man, where I'm already guilty. And that's how a lot of black men mentally think, not knowing subconsciously. That's why we so quick to try to run, so quick to avoid them. So quick to not be in their presence. You know, because it's like we already feel like we the fucking target anyway. And being a target in Watts oftentimes means being harassed by the same officer again and again. His name is Officer Patton. He the one who took John to the hospital. He also the one that brought John from the hospital and took him straight to Men's Central Jail. This one I couldn't find John, couldn't see John. I was standing in the back and I was getting some stuff out of my car. And I seen the back of a police car like cruise a little bit. I couldn't see the front of their car, but I could see the back of their car. But I could tell the car was like creeped up. And I looked and it was him. And he said, how is your son doing? And I'm like, how is my son doing? Why would he be asking me how my son doing? And at the time, I couldn't see John. I was trying to put him visiting past the scene. I couldn't see him. So I said, he doing all right, even though I didn't know how John was doing. He knew. I put that together later, but he knew. After John got killed, this was maybe 
about four or five months. My nephew, because I have a lot of nephews. I'm talking about, when I say a lot of nephew, niece and nephew, I probably got 50, 60 of them all together. I don't know if it was my sister-in-law funeral. I know we, it was something that had happened and everybody was leaving. And my nephew and them was parked maybe like about four cars down. And so they putting their stuff in the car and they finna leave. So I was in here in the house and I heard somebody said, call the watch commander. They had three of my nephews in backseat of the police car. It was him again, right? I heard like, it like a couple of doors down. So I go out there to see what's going on first. And so when I seen he had three people on the curb, he got three of my nephews in the back seat. And I said, I'm gonna go call a watch commander on you. I was going across the street to my mother-in-law house, me and my husband, and he told his partner, grab her, grab her, grab him, grab him. And so I said, oh, you gonna stop us from going to call your watch commander? What? And he said, come on, y'all come on over here. He wouldn't let us go call his watch commander because he put me up against the police car. I had on a robe, house shoes, scarf on my head. I looked terrible. And I was, he got me on the car. He made my husband go sit on the sidewalk with everybody else, like on the curb. And so I'm standing here and I'm looking up at that man and my husband say, yeah, that's him. And I'm looking like, who? But I know he looked familiar, but he dyed his hair. He dyed his hair. My husband say, that's him. His hair, just a different color. And so I looked up at him. So you know I got mad, right? I cussed him out a little bit because you the one took my baby and I haven't seen him since he pulled him back of the house. And I realized he didn't take John where he supposed to took John. The doctor even gave him a slip where he signed. And they say, when he get to, when you get him to Men's Central Jail, in other words, take him straight to the infirmary, take him to see the doctor. He didn't do that. He took John and Men's Central Jail on the other side. So now my daughter came out. I said, call 911 and tell 911 that they out here, the sheriff department is doing stuff to your family. So my daughter went in there. She called 911. She came back out. Mama, I called him. I said, go call him again. So she went back and she said, Mama, they still not come. I said, call them over and over and over. So she just went in there and dialed 911 about nine times. So about within five minutes later, hit about 12 cars hitting the corner, coming to help us with their own people. When he got out here, it was a black sergeant. I guess it was their watch commander. He said, ma'am, I got to put you in backseat of the car because I got to figure out what's going on here. I told him ain't nothing to figure out. He said, I hate the I said, you finna put me in back of the police car. And I was trying to tell him what had happened. I said, I was trying to go call y'all. And he put me on the car, so I can't go call you. He said, well, I'm sorry I have to put you back here, but make a long story short. All together, he had at least eight to nine people, not in custody, but detained, you know? So that's why the men come here like, just y'all two got all these people detained. You got two women and all these men, like, what the? So when he got through, he made my nephew it was his girlfriend car. They had to make this right. So he gave her a ticket. He made up something about the car with the ticket. So he made her, but I got that ticket with his badge number, everything on there. But they took him out the neighborhood that night. He was never seen again. My nephews that was out there, they was like, he was the worstest police. And I said, he the one took John to the county jail. They said he was so abusive around here. He was like the worst racist police around, and I didn't know that. And they seen it when they seen him out there that night. I say he the one took John. They say, oh, wow. Ain't no telling what he did to John on the way to that police station. Ain't no telling what he did once he got him there. They say because he abusive, that he did a lot of wrong around here. But they took him out the neighborhood that night. He was never seen again. They got him out the neighborhood. Who else is he abusing? This whole system fucked up to me. Like, win, lose, or draw, it still feel like we took a loss, you know, because we lost somebody valuable. But for how much money was thrown? To me, it don't make no difference because she still will never get her son back. And I never get my brother back. We never get our folks back. Though the family can never get John back in physical form, his presence has continued to live on in various ways, including his love for music, which is embodied by his mother's recording label. 
Head High Entertainment. I've never been able to just put my 100% into it because, of course, trying to get justice for John. But I do try to make sure that I keep everything going for the guys, try to keep them out, out of the street, do the best I can by them. It have changed. I, I can't say it. I remember when John first got killed, we had five artists that I was working with. And I had to just tell them, y'all, the door is open to you, but my brain not here right now. I need a few months. And they were just like, all right, auntie, you know, and they wouldn't even, a few of them weren't even my nephew, but they all called me the mama auntie. I just told them, let me get my mind right, y'all. They was like, we understand. We we already know what you're going through with John. But it, it did change it a lot because I couldn't put all my focus into it the way I really wanted to. So that's what I'm doing now. Because this spirit in here, it's painful, but it's joyful at the same time. Because I know John. I remember it was many days that I I was like, honestly, I used to say to myself, I'm like, you know what? I can't do this music no more. I just can't do it. And John would just be in spirit. No, mama, no. Keep pushing, mama, don't stop. John kept me going. He didn't want me to quit the music. It's kind of strange talking about it because a lot of people don't believe in spirits, but it's true because John helps me so much. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you how I found out John got beat. I mean, I know he got beat on the first day, but I'm talking about what Claire just really put the stamp on it. The next day after John died, my head was hurting so bad, I laid on the couch and I fell asleep. The deputies was beating me in my dream. It was started with one. It was so many was on top of me, I couldn't even move. And John was letting me know he couldn't move. And another time I had a dream, John was laying in the bed. This was just like a couple of days later, I had a dream John was laying in the bed. He had his head facing the wall and he was in a fetal position curled up. And I was like, why is he facing the wall in my dream? I knew him facing that wall wasn't right. One of the deputies said the same thing, that when he came, John was laying in the bed, facing the wall. He was saying like, the inmates don't do that. And John always told me that. He said, mama, when I'm laying in them beds, my back is to the wall and I'm watching the dope. And not only have he came to me, he came to my daughter, came to his father. It's the truth. Our kids do be with us in spirit. And it ain't because we want them to. It's just, that's what it is. And it's hard to tell somebody that if they haven't experienced. And I understand that because a lot of people be like, oh, they losing their mind or they doing this, they doing that. But we know what's going on with us. so. I remember one time I had a dream and we just gave my daughter a birthday party. Like a day or two later, I had a dream and John said, yeah, y'all had that party without me. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what the? And he was like, yeah, y'all had that party without me. Like he got mad that we had the party. <laughs> it was like, I was like, oh my God. Like, yeah, he said we had that party without him. I say maybe two years ago, I had a dream with John was, he had walked past me in his boxer shorts and he got in the bathtub. He fell down, but on the wall, braced himself on the wall and he's falling. And I ran, I said, what's wrong, baby? What's, what's going on? And he said, this is what they done to me, mama. He let me knew he couldn't walk after they got through. So there's no way all that stuff they said he did afterwards, cause he couldn't even stand up. For a long time, I never did even notice that they hit John in his back with the, with the flashlight because the lines of the flashlight is right in the back where his spine was at. And that's where they bust a two inch muscle in his back. So he couldn't walk after that. And I was talking to a, a doctor about all John injuries. I had the autopsy report. Now I said, this injury right here, was he walking after that? He was like, he wasn't walking after that. And he said, I'm gonna tell you another thing. All those injuries, he said, you know, in each injury, your body start doing certain stuff. He said he didn't live long after that injury. He said, I give him no more than 15 minutes at the most did he, did he live after them injuries. He said, because all the blood start mixing together and your body go in shock. 
He said, even from one injury, if you bleed too long, your body will go in shock. He said, but he bled from almost seven to eight different organs. So he really went into shock. We so, so he didn't live that long after that beating. I remember one time my daughter say, mama, did you get x-rays of John legs and stuff? And I say, no, Portia, you know what? They didn't give me x-rays of John legs. She said, cause mama, I had a dream about John and I could see them beating him. She said they would, they had, they was beating him with everything. She said, they, and she said, but they was mainly, they was beating him in his legs, like with flashlights beating his legs. She said, mama, you need to look into John legs to see did he have any broken bones in his legs. So that's another thing I want to try to get. They have four slides of an x-ray, but I don't know what it is. That's something I'm finna start digging into to try to seek it out. I want to get his body exhumed so the truth can really be told. Let his body come out because his body can speak for itself. And a lot of people say 12 years from now, his body might be in this condition, that condition. I'd rather try. The proof is there. How you gonna live with a busted liver, busted kidney, busted pancreas, prevalent spleen, and his spleen is missing? They said they washed his spleen down the garbage disposal on accident. You didn't do that. That spleen just too damaged and you got rid of it. You don't want nobody to see it. That's what doesn't happen. And that's what they do. With our, when our organs are missing, that mean the organ is damaged doing that beating or whatever they done. So they don't want nobody to be able to do a second autopsy on those organs. And John hasn't been the only one whose organs have gone missing. After you shooting their kids in the back of the head and in the backs and beating them in cells, taking their brains and their hearts, not giving them back. It's, 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 it's so much that they doing to our kids. Not only are they killing them, they stealing their, they stealing their organs. By the time you want to get them back, they talking about it ain't no good no more, so they, they can't return it because they don't want nobody to see that damage. So it's, it's just so much that they do to us. Tamiko Tyler, he was killed in, in Wayside by the sheriffs. They try to say Tamiko fell off a bed, hit his head, but all the time they beat Tamiko, bust his teeth, broke his ribs. They did a lot to Tamiko. Juan Correa, he got killed in the county jail too. They try to say he had a heart attack, but all the time Juan got blunt force trauma to the head, blunt force trauma to the chest, blunt force trauma to the back. They tased him so many times. They did something to his spine too, to where he couldn't walk. Right now, so far, you getting away with his death. And Juan, they took his brain, haven't gave his brain back to his family yet, because it's damaged, because he got blunt force trauma in the head, and the coroner never told his family he had blunt force trauma to head. Not even the attorneys told his family he had blunt force trauma. So his death is ruled as a heart attack. And it's so many, countless others. Waukesha Wilson, look what y'all did to her. You know, I won't go in detail. It's just so many. Quentin Thomas. Y'all killed Quentin Thomas in jail. Same way y'all did John. It's so many of them. Cases are in court now. So some certain people I can't really talk on, but I was given permission from Tamiko family and the uh, Wands family to where I can speak out any time to, to help other people with when I tell the story. Our system cannot be reformed. I think it's just too far gone to even talk about reform. I just feel we need to do something different, just all together, period. Our court system is set up to kill us off. The school system, first of all, you need to make this a family situation and you should make it friendly to make the mother want to come to the school. But when the mama comes to the school, you ask her questions, you ain't got no business asking her. Y'all do not try to help family. You try to find what's wrong instead of find out what y'all can help to make stuff right. I just feel like our jail system needed to be changed. County corner for damn sure need to be changed because y'all aiding and embedding law enforcement. They cover up. All the crimes is at the county corner. All the secrets and all the crimes is in that building. That's where all the cover up, whatever the sheriff tell them to put on there, on them the optage report, that's exactly what they do. 
that need to be changed. The judges, for sure. It need to be civilian oversight over them judges. It need to be civilian oversight over lawyers. I just feel like this whole system got to be changed. Can't reform it. It got to be something new in place because all the stuff that we living up under is all old, out of date laws, out of date policies. Nothing that they have to me is here for the people. It's here to destroy us. It's here to trap us. That's just like one of my cousins. They gave him Section 8. First, they put him in the apartment, paid up for like six months, a program they had. You give him free rent for seven to eight months. So now the apartment that he in don't accept Section 8. So now he got to go try to find somebody going to rent him that apartment. He couldn't find nobody that would rent him an apartment. Y'all only gave him a certain amount of time to find the place. So do you see what I'm just trying to say? Y'all say y'all helping, but you set people up to fail at the same time. And that's practically in everything that's going on, all our systems. You say you helping us, but in the end, you setting us up to fail. I'm not saying pay my rent, give me this, give me that, but don't try to push me on the ground when I'm really trying. I just feel like our system just really need to be for the people, and it's not. One of those systems is the prison system, and more specifically, L.A. County Men's Central Jail. I want it tore down, but then again, I don't. And the only reason why I don't want it tore down, because that means all the evidence in there is gone. If they do tear it down, I wish they'd go in there and spray it with luminol. You know when they go spray to look for the blood? I think if they go in there and spray it, I think it'll light up on its own. I would want them to do before they tear it down. And if they do tear it down, I feel like they should make a space there for us, the mothers, our kids. John got killed in the county jail, but I have to do his visual on the street. He didn't die on the street. He died in that county jail. So I feel it should be grounds there. It should be a, a spot on that land should be donated to our kids, to a memorial for our children. That's what I truly believe. But in the meantime, Helen creates her own memorials on John's angel versary. We gave a candle lighting. I didn't just do it for John. I did it for a few people. I really did it for everybody else because it was just like, let's do, let's turn this day into more than just about John. Because I know John would want that. I know that's the type of person John was. I didn't want to just that to be about him that day. So Juan, career mother, you know, we did it for Juan and we did it for everybody else. We just turned it like that. How can you help the family of John Horton? Helen would like you to use whatever means possible to amplify his story. John Horton was murdered. He was beaten to death on March 30th, 2009 in Men's Central Jail by 10 3,000 boys, the deputy sheriff gang members that viciously run the third floor of Men's Central County Jail. 12 years later, and there still has been no justice for John. Please also amplify the story of Jelani Levitt, who was also beaten to death and murdered by the 3,000 boys deputy sheriff gang on September 22nd, 2021. And the 3,000 boys gang tried to stage Jelani Lovett's death. We must stop the sheriff gangs from committing genocide on our children now. The gangs have been killing black and brown folks since the 1970s for gang initiation. Helen has also shared that the Los Angeles Sheriff Department has 18 known vicious deputy gangs that are committing genocide on black and brown men and women. Join the fight to ban qualified immunity. For more information on depositions, Please listen to our episode on Jamar Clark, also known as Jamar Burns Hill. Special thank you to the family of John Horton. We appreciate you for sharing your story. Names of the Fallen mentioned in these episodes. Tamiko Tyler. Juan Correa. Waikisha Wilson. Quentin Thomas. Jelani Lovett, John Horton. Hey, 
And a special thank you to our DCP Entertainment team, co-host and executive producers, Chris Colbert and myself, Adele Coleman, editor and sound design, Byron Hunt, producers, Heather Johnson, Ryan Woodall, and Mike DuBose, and associate producer, Quentin Hill. <laughs>